Jerusalem is a city where history unfolds on every corner. At its center, one particular spot known as the Temple Mount ignites endless debate. For Jews, it's the holiest ground, once graced by a magnificent temple, tragically destroyed twice. Now an Islamic holy site dominates the landscape. But whispers of a Jewish third temple are swirling through the ancient city. Will this ever become reality? Or is it just a dream of the past destined to remain a whisper? Let's untangle the threads of this complex issue and see if a third temple could ever rise from the ashes. Tracing the Legacy of Jerusalem's Temples The Bible places a lot of emphasis on the temple in Jerusalem, both in its historical accounts and prophetic messages. This temple wasn't just a building. It was a symbol of the covenant between God and His chosen people, the Israelites. Unfortunately, history isn't always kind to such sacred places. The second temple, built after the destruction of the first, met its demise in 70 AD. This event left a deep scar, not just on the physical landscape of Jerusalem, but also in the hearts and minds of people who study Bible prophecies. Ever since, a burning question has lingered. Will there be a third temple, and if so, when? This question is particularly intriguing because the Bible seems to hint at the cessation of sacrifices during the end times as referenced in Daniel 12 verse 11. This has led many to believe that a third temple must be constructed for these offerings to resume before they ultimately stop. So, to unravel the mystery of the third temple, we need to rewind and explore the stories of the first two temples that stood in Jerusalem. Understanding their history and significance will provide valuable context as we explore the possibility of a third one rising from the stones, the first temple. The very first temple in Jerusalem held immense significance, according to Jewish tradition. The Bible tells a story in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, of how God spoke to King David through a prophet named Nathan. God's message was clear. When David's time came to an end, a descendant of his would be chosen to rule and establish a lasting kingdom. This special king would also be entrusted with building a permanent house for God's name, a magnificent temple that would solidify the bond between God and his people. And just as God had promised, one of King David's sons, Solomon, became king and got to fulfill the special task. The location of this grand temple wasn't random, it was built on a very special spot in Jerusalem called Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah in Jerusalem held immense significance in the biblical narrative. This was the very same mountain where Abraham, the father of the Israelites, faced a monumental test of faith. According to Genesis 22, God commanded Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham's unwavering devotion was proven, and God in return spared Isaac and established a lasting covenant with Abraham and his descendants. So, Mount Moriah became a holy place, a symbol of Abraham's obedience and God's faithfulness. Building this grand temple marked a big shift for the Israelites. Up until then, they had been more like wanderers, moving from place to place. They used a special tent called the Tabernacle for their worship ceremonies. But with a permanent temple, they were putting down roots, becoming a settled society. The establishment of the first temple coincided with the rise of a monarchy, with a king ruling over the Israelites. Interestingly, a royal palace was built right next to the temple, sending a powerful message to the people. The close proximity symbolized that God worked through the king, making the king a crucial figure in the Israelites' lives. In a way, the temple became a special place of worship for the king himself, almost like a private chapel. This, along with the growing power of the priests, made the temple seem like a place for the elite, not necessarily for everyone. Once it was finished, this first temple became the center of religious life in Israel. For nearly 400 years, it stood as a symbol of God's presence with His people. Within its walls, they worshipped, celebrated festivals, and offered sacrifices to God. However, this era of prosperity wouldn't last forever. Tragedy struck in 586 BCE when the Neo-Babylonian Empire besieged Jerusalem. The first temple was utterly destroyed, leaving behind a sense of devastation and marking a turning point in the history of the Jewish people. The Second Temple Even though the first temple's destruction was a terrible blow, there was a flicker of hope for the future. 
The prophet Isaiah, living centuries before King Cyrus of Persia even rose to power, had delivered a message of future restoration. In Isaiah 44 verse 28, God's voice echoes through the ages, declaring Cyrus, his shepherd, who would fulfill a divine purpose. And this purpose was to rebuild Jerusalem and lay the foundation for a new temple. Fueled by this prophecy, the Israelites, after enduring 70 years of exile in Babylon, were finally granted permission to return to their homeland. King Cyrus, driven by a force perhaps he didn't fully understand, issued a decree allowing them to rebuild their city and their temple. Despite their eagerness, the task of rebuilding the temple wasn't easy. Opposition arose from neighboring peoples who threatened the project's progress. Additionally, some within the Jewish community itself lacked the zeal or resources necessary for such a monumental undertaking. Discouragement threatened to stall the project entirely, but God wouldn't let his promises be forgotten. Through the prophet Haggai, he delivered a powerful message. He challenged the Israelites, asking why they focused on building comfortable homes for themselves while the temple, a symbol of their faith, remained in ruins. This divine rebuke rekindled their commitment, and with renewed dedication, they pushed forward. Finally, after years of toil, the second temple rose from the ashes of the first. In approximately 515 BCE, it stood proudly on the same sacred ground where its predecessor once existed, hope amidst ashes. The second temple stood for centuries. It witnessed a significant transformation during the reign of King Herod. Herod, though a controversial figure, undertook a massive renovation project by expanding the Temple Mount and constructing a grander temple complex. This transformed structure became known as Herod's Temple, and it was a familiar landmark during the time of Jesus' earthly ministry. However, the Second Temple wasn't destined to stand forever. In the year 70 AD, Roman forces laid siege to Jerusalem. The Second Temple, like its predecessor, was destroyed in the ensuing conflict. This event marked another devastating blow for the Jewish people. The desire to rebuild the Temple, however, remained strong. During the Bar Kokhba revolt from 132 to 135 AD, a Jewish leader named Simon Bar Kokhba, along with Rabbi Akiva, a prominent scholar, saw the temple's reconstruction as a symbol of liberation and a rallying point for their fight against Roman rule. However, their rebellion ultimately failed, and the Romans imposed even harsher restrictions on the Jewish people, including a ban on entering Jerusalem except for the Tisha B'Av Day of Mourning. The dream of rebuilding the temple flickered once more in 363 AD. Roman Emperor Julian, known for his opposition to Christianity, ordered Olypius of Antioch to oversee the temple's reconstruction. This move was seen as an attempt to bolster non-Christian religions within the empire. However, the project was met with a mysterious end. Historical accounts vary with some suggesting divine intervention in the form of fire from heaven, while others point to sabotage, accidental fire, or even an earthquake. Whatever the cause, this marked the final attempt to rebuild the second temple in antiquity. Despite this, the hope for a third temple continued to take root. This desire wasn't merely a fleeting sentiment. It found expression in the daily prayers of observant Jews. Three times a day, during the Amida prayer, a formal petition for the temple's reconstruction is offered. This demonstrates the deep significance the Third Temple holds, particularly within Orthodox Judaism. It wouldn't just be a building, it would be the holiest site in Judaism, a place of pilgrimage and worship, a tangible symbol of God's presence among His people. The concept of a Third Temple holds immense significance. But what does the Bible itself say about this possibility? The biblical landscape isn't always as clear-cut as one might desire. However, there are intriguing hints scattered throughout Scripture, offering three potential interpretations of a future temple. Two of these point towards a literal temple rebuilt on the physical site, while the third takes a more symbolic approach. Let's delve deeper into these biblical suggestions and explore what they might tell us about the possibility of a third temple rising in Jerusalem. The Third Temple in Biblical Prophecy The prospect of a third temple is deeply intertwined with interpretations of biblical prophecy, 
particularly within certain branches of Christianity. Some scholars point to specific passages in the book of Daniel as hinting at its future construction. One key text comes from Daniel 8 verse 9 to 14. This passage speaks of a little horn that will rise to power and cause the daily sacrifices to cease. While the historical context suggests this little horn could be a reference to a specific ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes, some interpret it as a symbolic foreshadowing of a future end-time figure. This figure, they believe, will be a powerful leader aligned with a corrupt political entity referred to as the Beast. This interpretation connects the cessation of sacrifices to a future tyrannical regime that will disrupt religious practices. Another passage in Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 adds fuel to the fire. Set against the backdrop of end-time events, it speaks once again of the daily sacrifice being taken away. These repeated references to interrupted sacrifices lead some to believe that a third temple will be built, complete with an altar upon which these offerings will be made. In their view, the resumption of sacrifices signifies a crucial step leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. Beyond the book of Daniel, the words of Jesus himself add another layer to this discussion. In Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus prophesied about an abomination of desolation that would stand in the holy place before his return. Some interpret this holy place as a clear reference to a future temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This interpretation suggests that a temple will not only be rebuilt, but that it will also be desecrated by a malevolent force in the end times. Ezekiel's Prophecy of the Third Temple the book of Ezekiel adds another layer of intrigue to the discussion of the third temple. Chapters 40 through 48 offer a detailed vision of a temple, leading some to believe it's a blueprint for a future physical structure. The descriptions are vivid, outlining the temple's layout, its furnishings, and even the rituals that would take place within its walls. However, deciphering the timing of this temple's construction is no easy feat. If, as some propose, it refers to the millennium, a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth following his return, a question arises. You see, the passages in Ezekiel also speak of animal sacrifices being offered again. This seems to contradict the Christian belief that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was a one-time offering, sufficient for all time. How can these seemingly contradictory ideas be reconciled? There are several schools of thought on this matter. One viewpoint suggests that these chapters are actually looking back in time, describing a vision of Solomon's temple in all its glory. However, this explanation faces a challenge. Ezekiel received this vision after Solomon's temple had already been destroyed. Why would God provide a detailed vision of a past structure? Another interpretation suggests that Ezekiel's vision served as divine instructions for rebuilding the second temple, or perhaps Herod's renovation project. This perspective seems more chronologically aligned, but it doesn't fully explain the elaborate sacrificial system described in the vision. A final view takes a more symbolic approach. It proposes that these chapters are not literal blueprints for a physical temple, but rather allegorical representations of the church itself. This interpretation emphasizes the concept of God dwelling among his people, not in a physical structure, but in the hearts of those who follow him. The Spiritual Temple in the New Testament as we go deeper into the discussion about the Third Temple, it's important to acknowledge a contrasting viewpoint presented within the New Testament. Here, the concept of a physical temple takes a back seat, and a more symbolic understanding of God's dwelling place emerges. Several passages throughout the New Testament refer to the people of God themselves as a spiritual temple. This idea might seem surprising, considering these writings were composed during the time the Second Temple still stood in Jerusalem. Yet the emphasis seems to be shifting. The focus isn't on bricks and mortar, but on the hearts and lives of believers. The Apostle Paul, in his letters to various churches, lays out this idea in compelling terms. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 to 17, he writes directly to the church in Corinth, asking a pointed question, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? This is a profound statement. Paul isn't suggesting that these believers are merely attending a physical temple. He's declaring that they themselves are the temple. 
This theme continues throughout Paul's writings. In another letter to the Corinthians, he warns against sexual immorality, reminding them that their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The concept of the spiritual temple offers a unique perspective on the discussion about the third temple, negotiating the future of Temple Mount. Presently, the question of whether and when to actually build this third temple is far from simple. It's a topic that sparks lively debate within the Jewish community itself, as well as among other religious groups. Within Judaism, there's no single unified voice on this issue. Mainstream Orthodox Judaism generally takes a more passive approach. They believe the decision and timing of the Third Temple's construction should be left to God's will and the arrival of the Jewish Messiah. They trust that when the time is right, divine providence will guide the way. However, there are some dissenting voices within Orthodoxy. A small but vocal minority actively advocate for the building of a Third Temple in the present day. Organizations like the Temple Institute, the Temple Mount Administration, and the Temple Mount and Eretz Yisrael Faithful Movement are all dedicated to this goal. Their shared objective is to see a third temple rise on Mount Moriah or Temple Mount, the very spot where the previous temple stood. The issue of the third temple also extends beyond the boundaries of Judaism. The rise of Abrahamic religions like Christianity and Islam has added layers of complexity to the discussion. These faiths share historical and religious connections to the Temple Mount, making the prospect of a third temple a topic of keen interest and potential contention. Subscribers pick. All right, everyone, buckle up for today's subscriber pick because it takes the whole third temple debate to a whole new level of weirdness. Recently, rumors have been swirling that the third temple is finally being built but now something just emerged. Well, that something is what has got everyone talking. We recently found an image that shows the Temple Mount, with the iconic Dome of the Rock gleaming in the background. But that's not all that caught our eye. Take a closer look at the image. Can you spot that strange humanoid figure lurking in the background behind the Dome of the Rock? Yeah, it's got us scratching our heads too. Social media is abuzz with speculation. Is it an angel, an alien, or a giant stone statue? The truth is, we just don't know. It could be a clever Photoshop job or something more extraordinary. Here is the thing. With the tensions surrounding the Temple Mount, any anomaly is bound to be amplified. So what do you think? Is this image a sign of something divine or just a cleverly crafted fake? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. The Six-Day War and the Revival of Temple Mount Aspirations The establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 marked a turning point in Jewish history. It also reignited the conversation about the Temple Mount and the possibility of a third temple. For centuries, the Temple Mount had been under Muslim control. Now, in the wake of the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel captured the old city of Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount. Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, a prominent figure within Israeli society, emerged as a key player in this unfolding drama. Known for his outspoken views on Jewish sovereignty over the Temple Mount, he took bold steps to advocate for Jewish access and prayer on the holy site. In August 1967, shortly after the Six-Day War, Rabbi Gorin led a group of 50 Jews onto the Temple Mount. Their intention was simple yet audacious, to hold a public prayer service. This act of defiance was met with resistance from both Muslim guards and Israeli police, but Gorin and his followers managed to hold a prayer service. Rabbi Gorin's actions were highly controversial. The Israeli Defense Ministry strongly criticized his behavior and considered it inappropriate. In addition to this, his actions challenged the prevailing religious understanding at the time. The chief rabbinate of Israel reaffirmed the existing restrictions on Jews ascending the Temple Mount due to concerns about ritual impurity. However, Rabbi Gorin remained undeterred. He disagreed with his colleagues and argued that not only were Jews permitted to visit and pray on the Temple Mount, but it was actually a religious obligation. He continued his advocacy for a Jewish presence on the holy site, conducting annual High Holy Day services within the Makkami building overlooking the Temple Mount. His brother-in-law, Rabbi Shear Yashuv Cohen, a former chief rabbi of Haifa, 
also echoed his calls for the establishment of a synagogue on the Temple Mount. A Clash of Faiths Rabbi Gorin's activism for the Third Temple extended beyond public prayer services. From the 1960s onward, he became a vocal advocate for its physical construction on the Temple Mount. He believed that a rebuilt temple was not just a historical aspiration, but a vital step towards fulfilling Jewish destiny. In 1983, Rabbi Gorin, along with several other rabbis, joined forces with Rabbi Yehuda Getz, who worked for the Israeli Religious Affairs Ministry at the Western Wall. Getz had been involved in the excavation of a chamber beneath the Temple Mount. News of this tunnel soon got out, and it sparked outrage. In the summer of that year, Rabbi Gorin and his colleagues toured the site. This event culminated in a violent clash between young Jews and Arabs in the surrounding area. The Israeli authorities were forced to take action. To stop the unrest and prevent further damage, the Israeli police swiftly sealed the entrance to the tunnel with concrete. This action effectively shut down any further exploration or access. Today, a glimpse of the sealed entrance can be seen from the Western Wall Tunnel, which opened to the public in 1996. For many years, Jewish religious leaders, like the chief rabbis of Israel, Isser Yehuda Unterman and Yitzhak Nisim, advised Jews against going on to the Temple Mount at all. This was seen as a way to avoid conflict with Muslims, who also revere the site. Some believe this ruling may have been influenced by the Israeli government, but its main purpose was to keep the peace. Within the religious Zionist branch of Orthodox Judaism, the consensus continues to uphold this restriction. Rabbinical authorities maintain that entering any part of the Temple Mount remains forbidden for Jews. This position was further solidified in January 2005 with a signed declaration reaffirming the 1967 decision. However, the issue remains a source of tension. In 2014, on the eve of Shavuot, a Jewish holiday, around 400 people defied the religious restrictions and ascended the Temple Mount. Some were even photographed engaged in prayer. Hurdles to rebuilding the Third Temple Despite the fervent desires of some, the dream of rebuilding the Third Temple faces significant hurdles in the modern world. These obstacles are not merely theoretical. They are deeply rooted in the political and religious realities of Jerusalem. The reality of the Temple Mount itself is also another thing to consider. This sacred space is not a vacant lot awaiting construction. Two magnificent Islamic structures stand proudly on the mount, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. Their presence creates a seemingly insurmountable obstacle to any plans for a third temple. But how did these iconic structures come to be there? To understand the current situation, we need to rewind time to the 7th century AD. In 673 AD, Jerusalem fell to the forces of the Islamic Caliphate. After centuries of Roman rule, the city entered a new era under Muslim authority. The caliph at the time, Umar, made a significant decision. He allowed the remaining Jewish population to return and live within the city walls. This act of tolerance offered a glimmer of hope. Some reasoned that the caliph would, perhaps, extend this goodwill further and permit the building of a third temple. This could serve as a gesture of unity and forge stronger ties between the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. There's no denying that Caliph Umar was interested in developing the Temple Mount. Upon entering the newly conquered city, he was reportedly disturbed by the site's neglected state. So he initiated a project to clear away debris and restore some order to the sacred space. Here, however, history took a different turn. While rebuilding the temple seemed like a possibility, it ultimately didn't come to pass. Instead, Caliph Umar opted for the construction of a modest wooden mosque on the Temple Mount, and this marked a new chapter in the history of the holy site. The wooden mosque was eventually replaced by the magnificent Dome of the Rock, which was commissioned by Caliph Abd al-Malik in 691 AD. Today, both the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque stand as revered Islamic holy sites, attracting pilgrims from across the Muslim world. Any attempt to disturb these structures, reduce access to them, or even build a Jewish structure in close proximity would undoubtedly spark international outrage. 
This is the stark reality that overshadows the aspirations of those who advocate for a third temple. Theological Challenges in Reconstructing the Temple Traditionally, the dome is believed to occupy the exact spot where the second temple once stood. However, some scholars challenge this notion. They propose alternative locations for the second temple, either slightly north of the Dome of the Rock or even further south, closer to a freshwater spring known as the Gihon Spring. This uncertainty about the precise location of the second temple adds another layer of difficulty to the question of rebuilding a third temple. But beyond the physical location, there are deeper religious considerations within Judaism itself. Many Orthodox Jewish scholars hold the view that any attempt to rebuild the temple before the coming of the Messiah is not only impractical, but also theologically problematic. Their reasoning is twofold. Firstly, there is significant debate about the exact dimensions required for the temple. The Hebrew Bible provides measurements in cubits, but there is no definitive answer on the exact length of a cubit. Some scholars believe a cubit equals 1.84 feet, while others, like respected historian Asher Selig Kaufman, argue for a shorter cubit of 1.43 feet. This seemingly minor difference in measurement translates to a significant discrepancy in the overall size of the temple. Without a clear consensus on the proper cubit length, constructing the altar, which is a crucial element of the temple, becomes impossible. Secondly, the Talmud, a central text in Rabbinic Judaism, recounts that the successful construction of the Second Temple was only possible under the direct guidance of prophets like Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These prophets provided divine instruction and ensured the project adhered to God's will. In the absence of such prophetic revelation, many Orthodox Jews believe that rebuilding the Temple would be a futile endeavor, even if the current Islamic structures were no longer present. Evolving Perspectives on the Third Temple the debate surrounding the Third Temple extends beyond Orthodox Judaism. Other branches of Judaism, as well as Christianity, offer a range of viewpoints on this complex issue. Conservative Judaism, for example, shares the belief in a Messiah and a rebuilt temple. However, they diverge from Orthodox Judaism on the question of sacrifices. Conservative Judaism envisions a Third Temple without a return to the sacrificial practices of the past. Reflecting this view, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards within Conservative Judaism has even modified traditional prayers. While these prayers still call for the restoration of the Temple, they no longer advocate for the resumption of sacrifices. Reform Judaism takes a more progressive stance. They reject the notion of physically rebuilding a central Temple or reviving the practices of sacrificial worship associated with the Second Temple period. Reform Judaism views the Temple era and its rituals as a stage in Judaism's evolution, a time characterized by more primitive forms of practice. They believe that Judaism has moved beyond these practices and should not attempt to return to them. Christianity also presents a diverse range of perspectives on the Third Temple. Some Christian denominations see the need for a physical temple as completely unnecessary. This view stems from the core belief that Jesus Christ himself fulfills the role of the temple. They point to passages in the Gospel of John where Jesus refers to his own body as the temple. This concept extends to the idea that Christians, as part of the body of Christ, are themselves part of a spiritual temple. In this sense, the need for a physical structure like the third temple becomes less significant. So, what does the future hold for the Temple Mount and the possibility of a third temple? The situation is complex and there's no easy answer. Right now, things are pretty much at a standstill. There is no strong push from either a religious or political standpoint to build a third temple. However, history shows us that things can change quickly. In the past, powerful leaders from outside the region have gotten involved in Jerusalem for their own reasons, not necessarily because of any deep connection to the Jewish faith. So, it's impossible to say for sure what might happen in the future. Will the Third Temple truly wait to be built until the arrival of the Messiah or some other end-time event? Only time will tell. But one thing is for certain. The Temple Mount will undoubtedly remain a significant and controversial place for years to come. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.